All right. Okay. All right. Uh, morning, everyone. Started in on the material. I'll take two minutes to answer homework questions. Yes. Will you be giving hints today? Uh, like hint two? Possibly. <laughs> By tom well, either today or tomorrow. One of the days, yes. Yes, the hints will be, no, you shouldn't rely on them, right? They're gonna help you get unstuck. Any other questions? For part one, is there any significance of the type of message we are sending? Like ICMP or TCP or UDP? What do you mean significance? Like we just check the type specified in the parameters and then just make it something like IP by TCP or mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so it's your, your, right, so the IP packet is below, or is gonna encapsulate whatever the lower level yeah. messaging layer is, exactly. So the uh, point of the type is that you can show that you can use easily different types of messages to encapsulate. Any other questions? Yeah. Some of the types, uh, the interface that is given, that is the interface in which we use is ND flag. Yes. So does it mean that if it is like e ETS, Zero, we have to make an ETS zero packet, standard packet of the lower level. No, no. So you, it's just like telling Scrappy that this is true, which I want to say that it is true. Yeah, you can actually, and uh, specifically that part, it's actually you choose, so it's, you can assume that the host you're gonna be sending to will be available on that ethernet. Like if you just send it to that host, in Scappy, there's two functions, the send and the send physical. Uh, you can just use the send function. You actually don't have to specify the interface. But if you're using a different type of thing, you may need to know exactly which interface to read from. Yeah. How does it read? Yes. I was wondering if uh, Scappy is Python. Is anybody else using Python 3? No. Okay. I can install it. So, up until now, I hope everybody watched the lecture on Wednesday, the awesome recorded lecture that I made in the hotel room, which was a lot of fun. Um, it's always actually a lot better being in front of you. 
and being able to talk to you and not talk to myself. Uh, so, the main part about that lecture was we dove into x86 uh, assembly. And so, uh, so if you're not familiar with x86 assembly, you should definitely review that lecture and go through some of the examples. Uh, I know some people are having problems compiling that the example Hello World file. I think it's a library or a I have to dig up exactly which packages you need to install to do multi-architecture support so that you can compile a 32-bit application on a 64-bit operating system. I think you just need a cross compiler. Uh, you need the compiler, but also the libraries. You need the libc 32-bit versions of the libraries as well. So usually that's what fails. <coughs> OK, so now that we know how processes are built, we know how the compiler takes the C code, compiles it into assembly code, we know how the assembly language works. Uh, now we want to know, okay, how does this, how does the execution actually happen, right? When we run a.out, how does the operating system know how to load and execute our program? Uh, so what are processes, processes for? Why does the operating system have processes? that abstraction for? Yeah? Multitasking. Multitasking? Yeah. In what sense? To be able to run two or more programs at the same time. Yeah, right? So we want our operating systems to be able to run two or more programs at once. And what do we also want them to be able to do or not do? to be isolated, right? Uh, you think I, uh, sandbox isolation, right? But we, we, it should be the case, right, that if we're running two programs on our machine, if one crashes, it should not crash the other one, and it should not crash the operating system, too. Um, and the sandbox concept is taken even further when you think about browsers and how browsers implement things, right? They're actually running, like Chrome is running each tab in a separate process. And so that way, if your tab crashes, it doesn't take down the whole browser, hopefully. OK, so when we invoke a program, we know that the operating system is going to start a new process for that program. And so what it's going to do is it's going to parse that ELF file. right? So we saw the ELF file format. It's going to look at each of those segments <laughs> of the ELF file. And then it's going to say, OK, each segment says, at this memory address, I want this, these bytes from the program in there based on this file. And so it's going to copy that, put it all in there. And so you can actually, with a, most Linux system, have the proc file system. So you can look for any process that's running on your Linux system. You can cat the file uh, proc slash PID. What does PID mean? Process, process ID. The process ID and then maps. And that will show you all the memory layout, the entire memory layout of that process. So it'll say things like, hey, I'd address this for this length. That's mapped to this part. And this address to this length, this is mapped to some other file. And so it's actually very interesting to look at that to see where everything is being mapped. Uh, if any relocation needs to happen, right? so the operating system could choose to move things around. If there's relocation information in the ELF file, then the operating system will do that before it's actually executed. Finally. Uh, we saw in the ELF header, there was the entry point of the function. So right before the operating system executes the program, it sets the instruction pointer to be the entry point of the program. And then it starts it, and it lets it go. And then execution begins. Right, so this is how the OS lifts that ELF file and actually creates memory out of it and creates a whole space for this process to execute in. Okay, so then what does the process see as the memory layout? So specifically in x86, and this is specific to Linux, and this is actually something that is configurable, but by default, usually when you use a 32-bit machine, in each process space, one gig of memory is reserved for the kernel in the highest level memory ranges. So from all Fs to starting with C, that should be one gig of memory. 
that's all reserved for the kernel. And so everything else below that, so what's the next address under C0000? B, F, 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 right? Boom. All the way down to zero. This is the, the space for the program. So why does it need to do this? Why does the kernel need to reserve? So how, so a 32-bit application we've seen, right, can only access to the 32 bytes of memory, right? So here we have our entire four gigabyte address space, right? So what's the process that the operating system does or what's the functionality of the operating system that allows each application to think that it's getting the entire four gigs when there may not even be four gigs? Virtual memory, so how does virtual memory work? level of indirection, right? So there's a lookup table that defines translations that, hey, for this process, when it's executing and when it accesses memory address BFFFFF, actually in physical memory that maps to something completely different, right? And so for each process, each process sees four gigs of space that it can do whatever it wants to, but actually it's um, due to this the virtual memory, each process is actually like where that memory, physical location that memory is can be completely different. And we can give each process the illusion that it has unlimited access to those four gigs of memory. So then why this kernel stuff in here? When the OS starts. When the OS starts? You need to access a particular code to actually boot it up. Yeah, so we actually do need to do that, but here at this point, right, the OS is already booted up completely, and now it's starting to run a user mode application. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, so it's actually kind of a performance hack in some sense, right? Because you don't actually need to do that. You could have, because of virtual memory, right, if you call, so what's the system call? So when you do a system call, right, that's a call from a user space. So user space means not in the operating system kernel. From the user space into the kernel to provide some service, right? So for instance, reading from files, writing to files, opening network sockets, right? These are all things that the operating system provides. Why does the operating system provide it? Yeah, it'd be a huge pain if every application had to know how to parse the ext2 file system or the ext4 or ngfs or all these different file systems, right? Every application would have to do that and know how to read and write a file from every different file system. But if we use the abstraction layer of the OS, the OS then has to know how to do that and every application doesn't have to need to know how to do that. So because of these system calls, when we call something like read or write this string to a file, if we actually already have when the kernel executes, if the kernel can be executing in our process space, now we don't have to change any of the virtual memory or any of the virtual memory tables when we do this system call because we can directly access the memory of the program. So, interesting artifact. The other thing that this does change, that I've, or one thing that does change that I'm not 100% sure about is I've seen some weird behavior. I think it's when you're running a 32-bit application on a 64-bit machine, I've seen the top of user space programs be all Fs. Um, and I'm not 100% sure why that's happening yet. But I'm pretty sure that's the case. But on normal, if you're using a 32-bit operating system, you'll see that uh, the top of the program here is at this memory. It starts with like BFs. Okay. So then we dig down and we dig into the user space of the memory and say, okay, what is actually happening here? So what's this memory layout? And this is actually, it seems like this is a very theoretical high level concept, 
Uh, but this idea and actually the details of how this is done is very important when it comes to writing reliable exploits for binaries. Uh, because you need to know where things are in memory and where the layout's going to be and how what you're doing is changing the memory layout. So first, at the very top, at the high level, we have all of the environment variables and arguments to the program. So what are arguments to the program? How do you access them in like a C program? Argv, yeah, so argc tells you how many arguments there are, and the argv is a pointer to a list of pointers, and each of those points to the actual argument that was passed in. So what's the environment? Yeah, environment variables. So all the environment variables that you have declared, what are some environment variables that you've heard of or used? Path, yeah, the path, P-A-T-H, right? Lib, include, home, your home directory, which directory is your home directory, right? These are all environment variables, and when you type in a command, when bash executes that command, that newly created process inherits your environment. So this is why when you execute a process in a current directory, it knows the current directory because it actually uses the CWD, the current working directory, to know where it is. So at the very top of the process structure is the actual environments and the actual argument parameters. Um, and so we're going to do so always throughout this, and I hope I'm not going to mess up myself. We're going to have high memory at top and low memory at bottom. So we're gonna have the high memory, the BFFFs at the top, and the low memory of the user spaces, at least the data process that we're looking at now is down to 008. So at the very top, we have the actual environment and RV strings, right? The actual data, the actual string data that we're passing in, right? So what's a string in, in C? Character pointer. What is a character pointer? How do we know it's a string? What was it? Yes. Just bytes that end with a null character. That's how we know it's a string. That's the only way we know. After that, we have pointers to these argv, these strings. Right? Because what gets passed into our main function? What was it? Yeah, but what, well, so, what else? We have argc, the number of arguments, and then the next one is pointers to the argv and the environment. Actually, so, um, yeah, actually, you can write a main method that has uh, argc int, and then uh, argv pointer, and then an environment pointer, so you can actually have access to the environment variables, too. Or you can use the libc functions to access that. So these are all on the stack, or on, sorry, this is all on, not the stack, this is all at the top of the process's structure. And then after that is the stack. So what's a stack, generally? It's a data structure, stacks. Come on. What was that? Lifo, yeah. Uh, you push and pop. And when you take something out, it's the last thing that you put in, right? So you push things on, and then you pop things off. Um, so we have a stack, and we'll see exactly what that's used for in a bit. But in terms of memory layout, the stack, which is used for local parameters, um, it's also used as kind of scratch memory for code that's being executed. So if we have some code that uses too many, uh, right, uh, has too many temporary variables, too many temporary variables for the number of registers, right? Because we have to store things in registers, and we need some memory location to store these, these values. So we store them on a stack as well. And so the stack is here. So if we can continually push things on the stack, what does this mean about the stack section? Does it just say fixed to a certain? Yeah, it grows down, right? So this is the other thing. So our stack's going to start here. As we push things onto the stack, the stack's going to move down. And then when we pop things off, the stack is going to move up, right? And we'll have, as our program executes, the stack is going to be continually changing. 
things are going to get popped off and things are going to get pushed on until wherever the current location of the stack is. So all of this in here. So what does this mean when we have a program, we execute a program about the starting location of the stack? What do we have that affects that starting location? Number of arguments. The number of arguments, right? As we pass more arguments, the stack's going to start a little bit down. What else? The length of the, yeah, the amount of data that we feed into those arguments, right? As we pass more arguments into argv, or more string data, right, that's going to make this part of data bigger, which is going to push everything else farther down, which means now our stack's going to be starting farther down than it was originally. What else? Recursive function calls. Say that? Recursive function calls. Recursive function calls? That's when we start executing. What about when we, before we even start changing the stack? before code executes, right? So before anything executes, if we pass in more argument data, that's gonna move the stack. Environment. environment data, yeah. That's actually a crazy kind of thing, but if you execute a program in different directories, the start of the stack can be different. and can be different than where you expect that to be. And then we'll see ex precisely how the stack changes based on function calls and all that during runtime execution. That's also incredibly important. Uh, after this, we have a segment for memory mapping, so any shared libraries that we're using will get mapped in kind of below the stack. So what's the difference between the stack and the heap? What's a heap? Tree. Yeah, I guess that actually the data structure uh, analogy kind of breaks down here. So what do we mean about a heap in a program? What was that? Yeah, malloc or anything like that, right? We want to dynamically create memory. This can just give us chunks of memory. So the heap usually will start somewhere below the stack. It usually starts at a fixed location. And it's going to actually grow up, right? So you can actually see this is kind of nice because we have, well, we have these two sections of data that as our program executes, Right, are going to be continually changing. So the stack's going to be growing down as we push things on, as function get called, right? And the heap, as we malloc data, as we create new objects, right? If we're thinking C++, every time we call new, something is going to be allocked on the heap. That heap is going to grow up. So what happens if they, if we use too much heap or stack? Yes, overflow, very horrible things happen, right? We run out of memory. Cool, okay, so the heap's up there. And then after that, after the heap, we have our data section. So our data section, as we kind of saw a little bit, has our initialized variables and any uninitialized variables, the dot data section and the dot DSS section. And that usually lives under the heap. Under that, we, and then we have the data section. And then finally, at kind of the very bottom, well, yeah, close to the bottom of our address space, we actually have, well, what's missing from here? Code. Code. code, yeah, we need the code that we're actually executing, right? <coughs> and because x86 is, what's a von Neumann architecture? What does that mean? What stuff? What was that? Multiple input, multiple output, something? Not quite. Instructions are stored in memory. Input process, output process, kind of. These may be all correct. Uh, it's not quite the thing I'm looking for, though. We can have code and data both. Yes, right? So the code and data is in the same part of memory, and memory can be code and memory can be data, right? So we actually don't have a separate part for, hey, this is code memory and this is data memory, right? Which actually allows us to do cool things like have JIT compilers that can compile code on the fly and execute code, right? So that's what why Java is able to be fast, because it's able to do this JIT compilation on the fly. Uh, so we need the code segment in here. Uh, so code was dot data, and it's going to be kind of at the very bottom. So this is why when we look at some uh, pointers, and we see the pointers, we'll see things on the stack usually start with BFFF, because they're at the top of the stack. And then the code 
Our code functions are usually in the eight address range. You usually start with an 804 or eight something. Okay, questions on process vector, yeah. Is that 008 address thick? Uh, I don't know. More or less, yes. But the question is, can you change it? That's the, the question I'm not 100% sure. Like, you can change this top, you can change uh, this, the split here between kernel and program memory, you can change that. So you could probably change this, and yes, so probably. <coughs> okay, so each process on Unix, right, we're executing a process, so remember we're thinking about program as process, the program, we saw where all the data is laid out, and we saw where the code lay is laid out, and so it's gonna be executing, doing some things. So now this kind of gets into a, the access control of a Unix system. So what are some of the key concepts on a Unix Linux system for access control? What was it? Uh, process ownership. Process ownership, so what does that mean? Uh, I don't know how exactly to put it, but When say two different users are running at the same time, one user's process cannot be killed by or hmm. interrupted by another. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So every process. So there's two main concepts. There's users and groups on Unix, right? So every user has a distinct user ID, and a user can belong to one or more groups or zero or more groups, right? And so every process that you run on your Linux machine is running as your user and as your group. So you can use the id command. The id command tells you exactly who you are and how you're running. Let's try that now. Let's see if it'll work on here. So even though my Mac is still a Unix thing, I can see that my user id is Adam D, my group id is staff, and I have actually a bunch of groups that I'm a part of. This is a weird Windows thing, or a weird uh, you know, Unix thing, or Mac, Mac is the word I'm looking for. Okay, let's start with this guy so I can have that. Uh, if I do sudo su, so what am I doing here? I guess I should fake type more characters so nobody can try to get my password from what I typed. <laughs> right, so when I do sudo, I'm now trying to be run as the root user, right? So if I run id, it's telling me that my user ID is root, right? And my group ID is zero as the wheel. And so I'm in all of these groups that I was previously in. So if I do, let's go to this guy. Okay. So if I look at my ID here, I can see, okay, user ID, Adam D, uh, ID 500, group ID 500. I mean the groups, Adam D and Wheel. Uh, where are these IDs and names stored? Invisible. In where? Kind of. Invisible. Ah, yeah. So etc group has all the groups. So I believe it's. Uh, I have to look up the exact file format. I believe it's the name of the group, maybe the hash password, and. A, uh, and the group ID. So this is where all the group IDs are stored. So you can see here, and then at the end, it's the usernames that are in that group. So I can see here that in the wheel group, which has group ID 10, is the user Adam D. Uh, saying there's mail on here, there's all these other things. Um, and we can see my own group here. So where's the user information stored? Password. Password, Password. yeah, passwd, our old friend. So what are the fields in passwd here? UID. So first the name of the user, then the hash pass. UID. What does this x mean? Does this mean the password for root is an x? Yeah. Just type an x and you're good to go. <laughs> Maybe we'll want to try it. What does it mean? Yeah, so it means that the password is actually in the shadow file. So we'll talk about exactly why in a second. Uh, then it has the UID, 
What's this next one? Group ID? Ah, okay, okay. This is, ah, and the groups file has all of your groups in it. Ah, I see, I see. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. Then this would be what? The, the name again? Seems strange. Which is uh, this field is optional and used for in ah the full username okay good that makes sense okay yeah so the uh, so that's the general electronic or electric not even electronic electric comprehensive operating systems oh that totally makes sense of why it's called that okay so that's just the name and then we have after that is the directory the user's home directory and then after that is the user's default shell. Right, so if we look at my password file, so we can see that root is shell has been bash. And if we look, actually don't even know what my home is. Ah, so here I didn't put a full name in for here, so I have an empty entry here for that GECOS thing. Uh, my home is home Adam D, and my bash is in bin bash. Okay. So this means when I run. Right? So when I run ID, it's showing me the user ID and the group ID of this command that I ran. Right? Okay. And we can see here, can we see with this sudo? No, okay. So then, how does the operating system know if I can access files? How do we, how does it specify what things I can or cannot access? File permissions. How do I check the file permissions? <coughs> yeah, so uh, the L option of LS will give me the full directory listing. So let's check out ETC password. Right? So this is giving me the listing here. So how do I interpret this? Who owns this file ETC password? Root. Uh, the, what user owns this file? What group owns this file? Root. Right? So we can tell from here. So if you have no experience with this, you should definitely take time to understand and see how to do this. Uh, we can see here that the owner of this file is root. So what are the permissions then on this file? Yeah. So on files, we can look at this directory and we can see, okay, it's a Three, there's three permissions, or three, well, that's all you think about it, permissions, capabilities, read, write, and execute for the user, the group, and other, everybody else who's not in those two categories, right? So what does this mean? Who can, so looking from this, who can read the ETC password file? Everyone can read it, right? So we have reads in the user, the group, and everyone. Who can actually change the ETC password file. Only root can actually change that, right? So if I, so when I run this cat command, right, cat is just a program, bin cat. Uh, I'm gonna output this to ETC password. Can I do this? Oh, clearly not. Why not? Right, I'm not allowed to do this. I'm user, right? We can see here from the ID command. I'm user Adam D. My group is Adam D. None of these things are root, right? I'm not the user ID of root, so therefore I can't access this. I can't write to this file etc password. So, but. Do I want to be able to change ETC password? What was in ETC password? Right, 
so there's a lot of information there in here, right? This is information about every user on the in the system. But is my information in here? Yes. Yeah, my information is here, right? Would I want to be able to maybe change my name? Yeah, it's my my name, right? What about my what about my shell? What if I wanted to change to ZSH or I don't know, what if I wanted to go back to just plain SH? Or what if I wanted to do some crazy shell? So how do I do that? I have to get root to do it? I have to convince the administrator to change my bank. Please, sir or ma'am, change my shell. And if this was a server with all 120 of you, do you think that's something I would want to do? No, I'd make the TA do it. But <laughs> even that, I probably still wouldn't do that, right? OK, let's talk about passwords. So where's my, so, so we said that the, dash, the x in the etc password file, right? The x meant that the password's not here, it's somewhere else. So where is the password actually stored? Yeah, etc shadow, but ooh, ooh, look at those permissions. <laughs> right, so why doesn't it allow me to read those passwords? It contains the hash value of the password. Yeah, it contains the hash value of the password, right? So if you think about your big systems like general, I don't know, actually know if general is using etc shadow, etc password, it may be using something, maybe using like Kerberos or LDAP or some other authentication mechanism. But the idea is, if I have all of you on this system, right, are you all gonna choose very awesome passwords that are unique and hard to guess? Probably not, right? And if I can, oh, I can't less that, but I can less password, right? But. What I can do, I would try the, what would be the first password you would try for everybody on the system? Password. Password. <laughs> I'd try password. That's what you're telling people to do. <laughs> oh, did I tell them to do that? We'll ignore that for now. Um, right, so I can go through and I can try to see if anybody else in the system has the password password, right? I can actually check each of them to see if that, if I can read these hash files, you read the hash passwords. But I can't, right? I mean, I, I can't see that because I need the etc shadow file. That's where the actual password is stored. So we've separated out now the, the secret information, right? But I should be able to know who else is on the system, right? In the password file, I can see who all the users are. I can see the home directory. So because of this, pretty much nobody has access to this file, which is good. Actually, Root can still modify it, but I'm not going to show you this file. That would defeat purposes, especially when it's going to be recorded forever. <laughs> OK. So how do I change that shell? So I guess first question, should I be able to change my own shell without talking to an administrator? Yes. Yeah, right? But what's the problem with this file? Right, it's unwritable. Only root can change this file. So how do we do that? Using environment variables. Mm -hmm. what? Using environment variables. Uh, environment variables aren't going to persist. So the shell is when I log into the machine, what's the program that first starts? No, and levels you have. Access, Say again? Access you have when you log in. So you can have bash.rc and rc.local. But then bash still has to start, right? I want ZSH to start as soon as I log in. I don't, I don't want bash. I hate bash. I never want bash. Your profile. What was that? These are all things that, so the very first thing when you log on the system, whatever's in the shell Usually you go is going to execute. Right? Right? 
this program is going to be executed, and what bash does is it does all these things. It reads the dot profile, it reads dot bash rc, it reads like a host of other files, right? Or it reads and executes them. And as part of that, you could have it start up your shell of choice, right? And start executing your shell, but you still haven't really solved the problem of bash starts first, and you hate bash. User mod? User mod? Yeah, almost. Well, let's. So what are the permissions here on this file? What's the X? So what are the three permissions? Read, write, and execute. Can execute this program, right? So what does this? What do these file permissions mean here? <laughs> yeah, the user root and the group root are the only people who can execute user add. So does this make sense? Yeah, otherwise I could be able to add users to the pro to the system, right? User add is how you add new users to the system. So I'd add, yeah, I'd add all the users I wanted to the system, right? But we want, the only the administrator, the root user, should be able to do that, right? So I can't call user add. So yeah, so it seems like the ch, I'm going to change it back. So I have to do, if I type in, what do you want me to type in for my password? You get one guess to guess my password. Adam is awesome. Adam is awesome. Adam is awesome. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Authentication failure. So close. So close. Oh, trick. And it ends with an exclamation point, obviously. <laughs> change it back, I put in my real password. I want bin bash as my shell, shell changed. If I go back to the EDC password file, I can see it's been changed. So what is this CSH file that we've been using, right? So it's, it's a program, right? We can see from that. And using the which command will tell me where that program is actually located, like which program is actually going to be executed when I type in CSH. So let's check the permissions on that. It looks so cool. So what are the permissions on this? Let's ignore the S for now. But at least what can I do? So am I so who owns this file? Root. Owner and group. And what can I do with this file? I can execute it because of the X, right? This means anybody can execute this file. So what's different about this than the other, than the user add or something that we saw? The S. What's the S mean? Sticky bit? Sticky bit? Means when you touch it, your hand like sticks. Uh, it is not, I mean, it is the sticky bit. It's not about touching it. So the idea is this is an additional 
flag, an additional bit that says, when you execute this program, execute this as if it was the, here in this case, the owner of the program. If the sticky bit was on the group, it would be execute this program as if you were the group owner of this program. So when we execute this program, what permissions do we have? Root permissions, yeah. So we're actually executing this change shell program as if we were root on, on the system. And so when this change sh program goes to change the etc password file, can it read and write that file? Yes, because it's root. It's running as root. Let's try this. If I do change shell and then I go into another terminal, and I do ps and ux, grab. So I'm trying to look through the process list to find that change sh. Ah, yeah. So we can here see here that change sh is running as user root. Right. So what if? Okay. Let's kill it. Right? So this is how it's able, this set UID bit, this sticky bit, means that execute this binary as if you were the owner of that binary. So this means you have all the permissions that that person has. So now what if I can convince change sh to execute any code that I want? Then what permissions does that code have? Let's say I trick it to output any file that I that I want. What file would I want it to show me to output? Shadow. Etc. Shadow. Yeah. Right. And does it have permissions to? Actually, it may not because the permissions were all zero. But you could change the permissions back because you own the file. So you could change the permissions so that you could read it and then you output that file. Right. So yeah, you could actually have it show you that file that you, the user, have no permissions to view. But because this change sh program, when you run it, is running as root, then it has all those all the permissions. Questions on this? So the way this works, we get down to it. So each process has what's called a real user ID, group ID, an effective group ID, user ID, and a saved user ID, group ID. So user ID, group ID, they're you know, all the same but different. So the real ID defines the person who actually started and owned that process. So when you execute something with the ch root, your real ID is going to say, hey, this is actually Adam D who did this. Your effective ID, though, is used to determine if you're allowed to do that thing. That's what's being checked against when you access a file. So when we run csh, what's our real user ID? Me. Yeah, that user. But what's our effective user ID? We are effectively root. Exactly. Uh, then the saved user ID comes into play if you want to try to drop and regain privileges. I'm not going to go over the details here. So this is where that set UID bit is set. So that way, when this program is executed, it executes as if it is that user. And so if you think about it from like a maintenance perspective, it's actually nice, right? This is what you want. I mean, this is how the administrator can basically give you little bits of functionality to change your, uh, change your shell, to even change your password, right? It, to change your password, you're altering that etc shadow file that should, is not readable even by you or writable by you, right? So. I think it's the PASSWD command, right? Was to change your password. Uh, so we kind of saw if we look at user bin password, right? Pass or we saw on change cell, but password also has the sticky bit set. Um, change as change shell. So it's also is interesting. So maybe this shows you can actually execute a program even though you can't read what that binary actually is, right? The chain user bin change sh, change shell, and here we're actually able to do it. Uh, okay, 
So, this, why is this important? So why are we talking about this? Uh, okay, these are just some methods of how to do this. I think I'm gonna, uh, this is how to switch between the two. So why is set UID important? Set it to zero, you become you have root privileges. Yeah, there are programs on our system, right, that are owned by root yeah. and have the set UID bit, the sticky bit set. And when we execute them, we execute them as root. So if there's a vulnerability or a problem in any of those files, we can leverage that to become the administrator of the system. Right? And so that's what we'll look at next. On Monday, we're going to get into all the binary attacks. So we've gone through all the background, but this is all the different ways you can essentially trick any binary, but specifically in this case, we want to set UID binary because we're actually on the system, right? We, we have an account. We want to leverage that to be administrator of the entire system. Cool.